so as Maggie mentioned, you know, the, the, the actual procedure of ERCP is done with what's called a duodenoscope. And so what's unique about these, as you can see from these pictures here, is that the actual camera, the actual optical interface and the lens uh, are all situated kind of at a perpendicular angle uh, to the to the axis of the scope. So uh, that allows for, you know, if you look at the panel down below, for instruments to come out the side and actually just kind of gives you what's called an on fast direct view of the papilla, which lets you, you know, do what needs to be done in the actual uh, orifice. So um, all of the equipment that I'll talk about actually goes through the instrument channel of the duodenoscope. So uh, there's, you know, different sized instrument channels uh, that are usually about three millimeters or so. Uh, that that all of our equipment sort of goes through. So um, one of the the critical pieces of equipment for ERCP is called a sphincterotome or a papillotome or just a tome of some kind. Uh, so these are all sort of examples of tomes. And then you can see that within these tomes, uh, you put kind of the lifeline of ERCP, which is the guide wire. So the guide wire kind of acts as a scaffold and you know guides every sort of instrument that you put down that instrument channel once you've established that the guide wire is in the spot that you want to be. So what you can see with these sphincterotomes actually is that they're not just a, a sort of flat catheter, but rather that they can actually bend. Uh, there's sort of a, an injection port, of course, where you can put contrast through. The, but more importantly, you can actually flex that. And so you see on the right here, uh, that sphincterotome is kind of hockey stick so that you see this, this cutting metal wire that's actually stiffer there. So you can also you can guide the sort of stiffness of the guide of the actual cutting wire as well as uh, the angle of the sphincterotome which can be used to the advantage of the endoscopist to actually get get inside the duct or you know do different things so so here's here's a video that we'll kind of talk through as we go through and maggie feel free to jump in please on any of these videos if you've got any pearls um, but this is this is what again a normal ampulla looks like uh, endoscopically so um, the video is going there. So now you see a sphincterotome that's kind of coming out, and through that sphincterotome, uh, a guide wire is kind of going into that duct and kind of trying to jab at that duct. So this is what's called a wire guided cannulation, which I would argue is not commonly performed in everyday practice, where just just the guide wire is trying to get into that orifice. Uh, so of course, in tandem to the endoscopic view, you're always checking your fluoroscopic view as well, where that guide wire is going. Um, so that didn't work for them to get in. So now what they're going to do is what's called a wire assisted technique where you just kind of embed the very tip of your tome into the papilla and then pass the guide wire through. So they're actually going to end up being successful with this technique into getting in to the common bile duct. Perfect. So this is actually kind of a still image of an example of the fluoroscopic view that you might see. And you can see here that the duct, in this case, has a bunch of kind of white, what we call filling defects, and those are all stones. So this is Maggie's patient, for example, that, you know, that's come in with abdominal pain and they saw stones on the ultrasound. So now what's being done is what's called a sphincterotomy or a papillotomy. So you can see that, again, that tome with the cutting wire is held nice and stiff. And they're actually doing what's called de papilla. They're actually breaking down the muscle uh, of the sphincter that kind of controls that opening. And the reason for that is that there's large stones or something on the inside uh, and also to achieve drainage of the contrast from the procedure, uh, you need to kind of open things up at the bottom. So you can see that doing this obviously exposes you to all of those risks uh, that, that we alluded to, both, you know, for pancreatitis and then more relevantly, you know, the higher you go, the more bleeding you can get. And uh, if you go too far, you can obviously perforate uh, through the actual bowel wall, which is not what you want to be doing. The cannulation and the sphincterotomy are kind of, you know, meat and potatoes techniques associated with ERCP that everybody needs to know how to, how to do from, from both the MD and the RN perspective. Um, so we'll take it a step further. And uh, for Maggie's case, I think you know we probably need some further equipment to deal, to deal with stones on the inside that we saw on that cholangiogram. So um, there are different kinds of balloons when you talk about ERCP balloons. So one balloon is called an extraction balloon, and you can see that on the left there, that blue catheter. So uh, the nurse controls the expansion of that balloon. So the inflation of it is controlled by, by your assisting nurse. So essentially what you can do is put that balloon in e either over a guide wire or just you know free form into the bile duct, and then inflate that balloon and kind Kind of use it as a dredge to just actually scoop out stones and apply pressure and, and, and bring those stones out of the duct. The second type of balloon uh, is often used in tandem with a sphincterotomy or in place of a sphincterotomy. So these are what's called dilation balloons and you're I'm sure very familiar with these 
with your luminal work. So these are just kind of controlled radial expansion balloons, very similar to what you would use for, you know, esophageal or a gastric or a duodenal dilation or a colonic dilation. Uh, so basically just radial force expanding outwards and again, breaking down that sphincter to try and, you know, open things up, especially in cases where you might not have the endoscopic room to continue with a large cut or sphincterotomy. And then there's all kinds of baskets. Uh, this is just one basket design, but there's, there's all sorts of sizes and shapes and types. Uh, and again, you can imagine that these basically go in, uh, you retract the basket, you put the catheter in to the bile duct and just kind of open up the basket and try and shake it so that it sort of captures and snares a stone and then close around it and bring it out. So this is a video um, of stone extraction using uh, just a simple extraction balloon. So we'll go ahead and play that. And um, you can see, you can see if you can count the stones in this one. So again, uh, now that they've achieved um, biliary access with, and done a sphincterotomy, they're going to go in with a stone, with a stone extraction a balloon rather, and then just kind of dredge out these stones where, uh, you know, so you see that balloon was inflated and now it's deflated. Now they're going to go back in and sweep a couple more times, see what else they can find. So you can see that A, the opening is nice and big, right? Because they did a sphincterotomy that we saw them doing before. And B, you can see that there's obviously tons and tons of stones in there that are all being nicely dredged out by just inflating this, this balloon uh, that we were discussing. So this is, again, just a very simple bare bones ERCP technique, just going in, inflating the balloon, and then dragging it out and, and getting whatever's in there. The balloon, mind you, is also uh, sort of useful for getting what's called an occlusion cholangiogram. So if you're, you know, kind of looking at particular interest or with particular interest at a certain area, um, you can actually inflate that balloon and inject some contrast above it to get some really, really nice, clear pictures with contrast so that the balloon, you know, keeps the contrast from just spilling out of the bottom opening. And then finally, um, again, there's, you know, this is just kind of ERCP 101. So there's tons and tons of other uh, equipment that we won't go through today. But again, I'm, we're just trying to give you kind of a very basic overview of stuff you might encounter. So stents, as you know, are just basic, you know, tubes uh, to keep things flowing where they ought to be flowing, uh, quite simply. So in the case of, you know, biliary um, stents, most often they're designed to kind of go around an obstruction. That obstruction can be from stones or a stricture or any kind of thing that we discussed. So uh, generally speaking, there are two types of broad categories of stents, and one is plastic and the other is metal. And there's many different types of metal stents, many different types of plastic stents, even a couple in between. Uh, but again, for today's talk, I think this is this is adequate. So, so the final video I think that we've got to show you um, is just basically the deployment of a stent. So again, here for, for once you actually see the tandem fluoroscopic and endoscopic images uh, that, we, that we use in ERCP that we frequently rely on. So on the left, you can see that the stent is being opened out and there's kind of a waist. It kind of gets skinny right at that sort of obstruction. And now on the right, you can see endoscopically that we usually like to keep a centimeter or two out uh, into the duodenum so that the stent is doing its job. And now you can see a nice gush of bile that's dra draining really nicely. Uh, and I guess that person had been obstructed for a while because that bile is pretty darn dark, uh, which, uh, you know, which is common from time to time. All right, so some take home messages from today. Uh, know your anatomy, your patient, your equipment, your team, your environment. Try to gain as much much knowledge as you can about a particular case, because the more you know, the better prepared you are, and with less surprises. No one likes surprises in your city. <laughs> Ask lots and lots of questions, especially if or when you're learning. Uh, there's lots to know and to remember, so ask and ask again. Um, the people that you do ask have all been novice practitioners and beginners uh, as well, so they'll never turn down the opportunity to teach, anticipate and communicate. Um, important to keep everybody on the same page, let everybody know what's coming up and, and uh, be aware of that. Um, never be afraid to offer your input and put the patient first. Uh, if you feel that your patient can no longer tolerate a procedure, um, be an advocate for them because uh, they're not fully capable to do so. So you're their, their, their mouth for the time being. Uh, be prepared and remain calm, especially when things don't go according to plan. So um, that's, uh, that's all you can do is be 
be prepared, know what can happen, have all the equipment that that you may need in those certain certain cases. And you're working as a team, you rely on each other, so you have each other to, to support you too. Uh, be resourceful and innovative. There have been countless times when we've used uh, various instruments and equipment uh, to, to achieve our goal. Uh, not every case is as straightforward as, as in textbooks. So use what you what you have to your advantage. Um, and when you learn of these new things that you can use, pay it forward. Let your team know uh, what's worked for you in the past so that uh, everybody else is successful in their endeavors as well. All right. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. I think this was a wonderful talk. Um, we do have a few questions in the question box and one person with their hand up. So I'm going to go in order of kind of how they came in to kind of keep it fair for everybody. Um, the first question says, uh, diet us tolerated post ERCP, question mark. At our hospital, we say clear fluids. Is there a recommendation or a preference and why? There's, there's no real evidence base uh, basis to, to that recommendation. So uh, there, we have, you know, pretty good uh, evidence to show that you know if you're going to present with a complication you usually uh, will do so in the, the immediate post procedural period uh, there are definitely exceptions to that uh, but if you know the reality is if you're going to get pancreatitis that evening or the next day um, having a full diet is not going to be the thing that precipitated that so uh, again you know obviously each case is different and like Maggie said most of the time it's DAT for that reason that you know there are exceptions obviously depending on uh, what the plan is or what happened intraprocedurally, but most of the time uh, we've shown that there's no there's no actual difference uh, with a, with a full diet compared to a clear fluids diet and then advancing. Perfect, thanks so much. Uh, the next question says, do you use CO2 for your ERCPs? Yes. Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah. We use CO2 for everything, and I think you know, um, hopefully it's becoming rarer and rarer for air to be used for any endoscopic procedure um, but for ERCP I think it's you know it, it is important just given that uh, the procedure time can uh, drag on compared to other luminal procedures so I think if you can uh, use CO2 and then for, for what it's worth we keep our CO2 on low most of the time for our procedures just because you know uh, once you're kind of on fast looking at the papilla and instrumenting the ducts uh, of interest uh, you know you, you only need so much air to keep that view uh, and then again you are reliant off and on on the fluoroscopic view more than the endoscopic view so you know less is more 